Uh, ready to start? Okay. Okay. Thanks for having me. My name is Yunbom Cook. Oh. Okay. 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 So you're good. Okay. Thanks for having me. My name is Yunbom Cook and. I'm an, I'm an undergraduate at Kai's best department. Well, today I'm going to talk about vertex specification for edge connectivity. And oh, by the way, the part of, part of this work was done while I visited Georgia Tech under supervision of Professor Richard Peng. And this is a joint work with uh, these from really several institutions. So, so many are involved in this work. And well, uh, today the goal of this talk is about introducing the notion of vertex specification. Uh, with the line of research in this topic, and furthermore, bring up our some particular specifier with hopefully appealing result, hopefully. And end of this talk, I would like to suggest some open problems that I have in my mind in purely mathematical point of view. And well, even though this problem comes from computer science field, and I think that I found some interesting mathematical problem as well. So please enjoy this talk. So let's get started. Well, say we have a huge graph with hundreds, billions of nodes and vertices, vertices and edges. Well, even though this seems so small, let's say this is a really large graph. But our scenario is we are only interested in a few a subset of vertices, which I call terminals, and I color by red right here. And furthermore, I like to know relationship between these terminals, so that like this relationship could be like, for example, like being cut max floor, like or Digraph in uh, so reachability set in digraph setting and so forth. Well, to toward this goal, I like to apply some graph algorithm A to this graph G. Well, but well, it may be not that a good idea because usually graph algorithm depend on the size of input graph, say the number of vertices, say the number of edges. But as I already mentioned, this graph is so huge, so it's quite natural to think that well. Let's remove some redundant part from the computation from for computation of relationship between these terminals, while preserving somehow some properties of our interest. So our idea is like okay after removing some redundant part right here, and then apply this graph algorithm to this smaller graph H, so that we may expect some a speed up of graph algorithm. And especially in this work, I would like to focus on bin cut or Minimum edge cut in detail, uh, because uh, minimum edge cut usually serve as like computational primitive for like elementary tools in many graph algorithms, but it's quite reasonable to focus on such property. Well, before we get into it, uh, I like to say uh, some few definitional things over here. I know most of you already know this concept. Just I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So our given setting is like just a weighted graph G with non-negative real weight on each edge. So, for a, for a partition of vertices like into A and B, I would like to define an edge cut of this partition. That is simply the set of edges with one, on the, one end point in A and one end point in B. Uh, that's the, simply the set of edges crossing between A and B. And I, I like to denote it by e.g. A, B with some uh, particular uh, subscript, subscript right here. Uh, uh, to tell you where I'm working in, and it's quite natural to define the size or weight of this edge cut simply by the same sum of weight of edges in the edge cut. So in particular, when the all the edge weights are equal to one, so the size of edge cut is uh, simply the number of edges in the edge cut. And for a subset of vertices x, I like to find the boundary of this set, boundary of this x as simply the set of edges stepping out of x to the outside. Now that we have all the basics, we are ready to define the partition of as edge cut of terminals, which is quite different from edge cut of vertices. So to begin with, let me define some separating step for this by partition, that is, uh, which literally separate terminals into T A and T B. And I like to define edge cut of by partition of terminal with respect to S as a simply the edge cut induced by S. And then, and then finally, we define a minimum edge cut, a mean cut for of this by partition. Uh, that is the edge cut of this by partition with which has the smallest possible size. 
So among so many step point set, one of which will have the smallest possible size, then uh, the size of such a, a minimum cut, I would denote it simply by as a min cut G. So of course I can rigor rigorously write down the, what min cut is in this form. So any questions so far? It's good, right? So now I can formally define what I, what I mean by presuming being cut among terminals. So what, it, what I'm given is a graph G, a weighted graph G, with the negative real weight on each edge with terminal including the vertices. And our goal is to you aim to find a smaller graph H, hopefully smaller, uh, with possible different set of vertices, different set of edges, and different uh, weights on each edges. But we still have this H still has a copy of uh, terminals in the original graph, and we want H to satisfy this property for any bipartition of terminals. That is, we want this H to exactly preserve all the mean cut values in G, and in H should be same like this one. So when H satisfy this property, I will just name it as a mimicking network, and as this name as this name suggests, this uh, graph H literally try to imitate the mean cut value in the original graph. That's why I call mimicking network. It's quite reasonable maybe, right? Mm -hmm. And as of now, I will write, I will use K for the number of terminals, just for, yeah. And G is the weighted graph with K terminals. And at this point, it's quite natural to ask, what is the best upper bound and lower bound of the size of mimicking network? So for the upper bound, for any graph G, we can always algorithmically construct a mimicking network with two to the two to the k vertices, and which is really a double exponential in k. I know it's really a gross, but I'll just so for the lower bound, very unfortunately, we can't find a, a specific graph instance G with some particular weights on edges, whose all mimicking networks has requires at least two to the k vertices. It's still exponential lower bound. Well, but even though for general graph classes, we have to create the upper bound and lower bound, we can make a much stronger and better upper bound for some special graph classes. So for example, for planar graph, we can find a mimicking network with k squared times 2 to 2k vertices, which is definitely better than this double exponential upper bound. And even for planar graph with all terminals lying on the same face, you know, some particular embedding of planar graph, we can find a mimicking network with only okay square vertices. This is quite an uh, amazing result compared to the upper bound right here. And a whole graph with bounded trellis, it only requires k times 2 to the 2 to the trellis. So for example, like for an outer planar graph whose trellis is bounded by 2, right? So okay vertices are enough. It's, it's also interesting. Well, but at this point, we may be very unhappy because of the exponential upper bound right here and the lower bound right here. So in this case, the usual approaches that theoretical computer science usually take is like start to consider sort of approximate algorithm in hope of getting a much faster, like in some sense, efficient algorithm. So our like, focus is like it comes down to all question like, okay, can you find uh, some approximate mimicking network with slight deviation from the original mean cut values? So for this goal, so we try to find a quality Q specifier, which is uh, in fact a generalization of the, the mimicking network that I just defined. Uh, so this specifier, I mean this quality Q specifier, uh, aims to find a smaller graph H whose mean cut value is uh, within a factor of Q of the original mean cut value, as described in this inequality. So this is first step toward uh, studying and understanding the tr trade-off between the quality of approximation and the size of the fire. And in fact, this is really a generalization of a uh, like mimicking network because there's simply a quality one price fire is a mimicking network because of this inequality, right? This is so easy. And even for this quality Q price fire, there are two possible types. The first case is where when you only only allow just terminal vertices. Uh, in this case, because we already have uh, the smallest possible size for quality Q specifier, our focus is slightly bit moved toward just quality itself, what is the best quality and 
applies to upper bound or lower bound for this quality. And for second case, right here, that is when you allow for additional vertices other than terminals, which I call trainer nodes. Uh, there's, so these two are possible types of quality specifier. So once again, let me give you some previous result in quality two specifier. So for the first case, I mean, when you only use terminal vertices, that is, the upper bound for the quality is low k over double or k, which goes to, to which goes to infinity as number of vertices, as number of terminals k goes to infinity. And what about the lower bound? That is also this quantity also goes to infinity as k goes to infinity. That is low k to the quarter or over a double or k. Well, as a side note, these two results, I mean, used way more some functional analysis techniques such as like L0 metric extension or like with this extension constant. So their approaches are quite far from like discrete and combinatorial approach. But anyone interested in this result, just check out their papers. And for the second case, when you allow for extra vertices, which I call standard nodes, uh, we can always find a grab G, or for any grab G, we can always find a quality three plus epsilon surprise buyer, so which use only C cubic vertices. And where C stands for uh, the sum of weight of edges instant to terminal. And Julia used some combinatorial and quite a, a structural knowledge to get this result. And for the quasi bipartite graph, oh, and by the way, the quasi bipartite graph means a graph in which uh, non terminal vertices form an independent set. So when you line up terminals right here and non terminals right up, line up here, then this graph always looks like a bipartite graph. So that's why I call quasi bipartite graph. So for this specific uh, cla graph classes, we can always find a sort of approximate mimic net, almost mimic network, because uh, when you go when you send epsilon to zero, this one plus epsilon can be as small as possible, so then close to one. So call it one plus epsilon specifier, which use only polynomial number of vertices, polynomial in k or epsilon, and the, to get this result, the author is to use some probabilist approach by using like important, sam important sampling and using churn of a bound, a churn of an inequality. So still anyone interested in this result, so check out the paper. Well, the current open problem is whether we can extend the last result, like this one, to the so general graph classes. Now I think it's a good place and time to bring up our particular specifier which I call C-mimicking network. I actually connectivity C-mimicking network, but I just call C-mimicking network for short. Uh, well, our sparse wire is quite a bit different from the previous one in two respects. That is, the first difference is our uh, C-mimicking network is more interested in edge connectivity. So our weights just take from natural numbers. And the second difference is our specifier is only interested in preserving mean cup values up to the value of c, which I call the threshold right here. So by taking mean cut uh, with by taking minimum mean cut with c right here. So base. So weight of h is only from natural number. Uh, so integer value. Yeah, integer value instead of non negative real weight. Uh, thank you. And in essence. The, essentially, this is a re really a threshold version of mimic network because when the mean cup value in G is smaller, smaller than C, you like to preserve the mean cup value exactly, the H. But when the mean cup value in G is larger than C, well, it's enough for this mean cut in H to be at least C. That's why we call just threshold, rever threshold reversion. And of course, this because this problem comes from computer science field, it has several applications in computer science, say like data structure, and we can expect some speed up solving some edge connectivity problem. And this application was uh, is uh, contained in our paper, so check out if you're interested. But well, because this is mass talk, let me focus more in mathematical point of view. And at this point, I think I should give some two remarks here, which reveal the importance of our works. The in purely mathematical point of view, one might ask a quite a fundamental question on structural property graph, which is like for for some given 
a combination of mean cost among k terminals, which is like two to the k minus one minus one like mean cost values, right? So how many vertices or how many edges are just enough to represent such a mean cost combination? Well, this well even though mean cost is quite uh, elementary and fundamental combinatorial property in graph theory, well we still had no answer before we doing so. And the next note is the, the open problem. I mean, the existence of quality one plus epsilon squared spire, which use polynomial number of vertices. So if this open problem proves true, proves holds true in our setting. So by simply setting epsilon strictly smaller than one over c, then this open problem should imply that the we should have there exists a c mimic network which use polynomial number of vertices, uh, which is polynomial in k and c. So this is quite this implication is quite straightforward from the definition of the quality q squared spire. And through our works, we 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 can give us uh, some partial result to each questions right here. Uh, and even for the second question right here, we prove that the dependency on k is actually linear. So I mean, not only that we prove the existence of c mimic network in polynomial size k and c. We also prove that the dependency on k, I mean the dependency on the number of terminals, is even linear. So let's move on to our main result right here. That is, uh, okay, this one. Uh, the f uh, actually, we have two different results, uh, which shows quite sort of trade-off between size and the, the time of algorithm. So for the first algorithm, it has uh, some better size compared to the second one. Uh, which takes a bit more time compared to the second one. And for the second algorithm, well, it is a bit faster time algorithm, but which gives a slightly worse size surprise buyer, I mean, C mimic network. Uh, I think I should give some note here that is, when you just fix C by some constant, then this term right here, uh, this one, and uh, well, ooh, this one, becomes constant as well, so that we can figure out that just uh, okay, I mean, k edges jersey are sufficient to represent any mean cost values among k terminals up to the value of c. And such a structure can be uh, found in nearly linear time because of the, this result right here. And because it's a best top, let me focus on just the existence of this uh, small, such a small size mean network. I think this is quite interesting result. So, okay, before we getting into some sketch of proof, let me clarify about our basic setting. That is, just instead of just weighted graph, we may assume that given graph is just simply a multi graph. Because when you have an edge with, say, weight 3, we can just replace them by 3 unit edge. Right? So, in this way, we can, we can just think given graph is just multi graph. Uh, with, without any weight, or just unit weight. And furthermore, the first fruitful observation we can make at this point is we may assume that the, the, degree of, the degree of terminals is at most C, because otherwise, I mean, in this from the, this illustration, from this, oh, well, I don't know, from the, <laughs> working? Oh, here. So from this illustration. Say that the degree terminal is more than C, then simply by some by doing some simple operations, we can get some equivalent graph. I mean TC equivalent graph. I mean C mimic network, uh, in which the degree of terminal is MOC. That is first of all, to introduce a parallel copy right here of the terminal, which has the same neighborhood with the original terminal, right? And then do it all the instant edges to terminal right here. So no edges between terminal and the original neighbors. And then finally, put C parallel edges in, in this between the copy and the terminal. And this actually gives us uh, C mimic network because say just consider any a minimum cut or in, on the right side. So if the copy, the terminal will stay in the same side of min, minimum edge cut, then that's fine, right? Because the mean cut should be the same with the original one. In the other case, I mean the, the minimum edge cut separate the copy and the terminal, then we already this edge cut already has at least C edges, right? Because of this parallel edges. But basically we are only interested in 
uh, up to the value of C, threshold C, so it doesn't matter. So just please just accept the, we can define all the, we can think all the degree of terminals bound by C. And the next thing I want to mention is contracting edges will better decrease link of value. So that it, as, as in this inequality, so uh, some con after contracting edges E right here, mean cause is at least or bounded by this original mean cause value. So say does this red vertex in the left side just indicates a vertex that you obtain after contract act contracting uh, contracting at E. But let's try to think about when you revert, I mean recover this contract at G, right, E right here. But when we can still force this edge to stay in the left side, so that the minimum edge cut in here is still on on edge cut, but we don't know, we are not sure this is still minimal edge cut, but this is still edge cut between the partition of terminals. So that, by the definition of mean cut, so mean cut of G, mean cut of G, uh, mean cut of the terminal in G should be bounded by this mean cut in here. That's why we get this inequality. Uh, so please keep in mind that contract edges never decrease mean cut values because this is key idea in our sketch tool. And also, uh, we can do sort of divide and conquer approaches to get a tissue equivalent, um, I mean, semi-wicking network. So, you know, divide and conquer is quite a common idea and approach in computer science, I mean, algorithmic design. We can do the same thing in this, in here as well. So, for a given graph G right here, it's quite tempting to just do this edge, and we may work, we may like to just work each independent part, I mean each component independently. But we can do this by complementing complementing some operations. So first of all do these edges here and then just mark their endpoint as additional terminals in each component. But it's sort of tentative. So after getting the after so pretending this endpoint of the deleted edges or term, terminals in each part each component, just specify somehow. I mean just reduce the size of it by finding C mimicking network of each component, somehow specify it, and then I would like to merge, glue them back to get, glue them together by using these deleted edges. We can identify the end point by using this edge so that we can get a much smaller graph uh, which is C mimicking network. And this is a valid operation. Uh, and the final thing I want to mention is we can always make the number of vertices in G and number of edges in G are within a factor of C. So that means when you have O n vertices, we can always get a TC equivalent graph, I mean, a BC mimicking network, which only has at most n C edges. That is, uh, by doing this subroutine, it C times, the C subroutine is just for a given graph G. We just find the maximum spanning tree in G for each component. You can find the some uh, maximum the span maximum spanning tree. So because for any non-empty cut, so the maximum spanning tree should uh, pro should use at least one edge in the cut, right? That's why uh, this is whole. This this is true. So after doing this operation C times, uh, at each operation we just find it and do it from G, G right here and then keep it aside here and do this C time so then and the union of the C uh, maximum spanning for us then the union give us the TC equivalent graph which use at most C and edges so now we are ready to get into the proof so our key idea is the, the retain sort of essential edges which contain uh, a minimum cut of size at MOC of any bipartition of terminals. Uh, the this actually works because, you know, uh, the retained edges, because it always contain the minimum cut of size at MOC, the, the contained edge cut will serve as certificate to achieve inequality of in this inequality that we got from observation, right? So, uh, is it clear to you? Okay. So, and then contract the all the remaining edges other than 
uh, mark essential edges. So a bird eye view of our proof is like just partition G minus T in this part into separate pieces so that each piece become either sort of non-essential part and uh, other piece has sparse boundary. It's, a, it's sort of exclusive work. And of course I will explain this in quotation mark later in detail. And then after doing so, oh, by the way, so to, further, to, to deal with the, to formulate the first part, I mean non-essential part, I define a connectivity C railing set, which is called an extension of railing set introduced by Reed in 997. And the two somehow make, sm make smaller, I mean, to, in order to make the a set with sparse boundary, much smaller equivalent graph, we use some a powerful kernelization result derived from gamma theory and you know, the propension set gamma. So to formulate, I mean, to formulate the first concept here, so I'll def I like to define connectivity to that link set, that is X. So how this is like, however you partition X into just A and B, the interconnecting edges right here is always denser than outside. So for illustration, so the interconnecting edges like EG A comma B, always denser than the intersection of A, uh, intersection of boundary of A and X, and the same for B. And as, like I mentioned, as an unnecessary part, this is good to contract, and a contracting rail link set still give us uh, equivalent, I mean, C mimicking network, TC equivalent. So the proof, idea, proof of idea is really simple once you start to interpret minimum mean cup value between terminal, well, partition of terminal as the maximum number of edge disjoint passes. So once you start to interpret them as in, in other view, it's quite clear. So that is, like, just say for some particular partition of terminals, say we have a, a maximum, maximum number of edge disjoint passes between them. And a, part, a portion of this collection of edge disjoint passes probably pass through X right here. Just say a portion of these passes just enter here, X, through some using boundary edges right here. But by the definition of the rail link set, because it, it, the inter interconnecting edge is always denser, it can successfully carry them without losing any edge disjoint passes. So, and then finally successfully let them out using some boundary edges right here. So without, of course, the key point is without losing any adjacent passes. That's why we are good to contract the connectivity rail link set. Uh, yeah, the next is, next doesn't have any intersection. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, you said that, okay. okay. So, oh, yeah, my bad, Thank, thanks for correction. <laughs> my bad. So, but, uh, when a given set is not well ring, which means there exists some particular partition of terminals which violate this inequality, that means say just a comma b just this partition of x, which satisfies its opposite direction. The interconnecting edges uh, is parser than minimum of two boundary edges right here, and when it, when this type partition satisfies this inequality, the opposite direction, we call such a violating cut because it violates it, right? It's simple naming. And now, uh, like I said in the, in the bird eye view of our proof, we should partition G minus T in some proper way. And this is how I do so. That is, uh, the base case for this partition procedure is uh, when X is connectivity to the link set, or when it has sparse boundary. Uh, what I mean by sparse boundary has the boundary of the number of boundary at G is bounded by at most two C minus one. So if given instant X has the skip the first line and come to second line, that means given that X is uh, has a violating cut, like say into X one and X two, and then then we recurse each half. You got it. And at this point, one may be one, one may be curious whether this procedure will stop, but this is true because Upon completion of X in according to violating cut, the number of boundary edges decreased by at least one. This is also quite 
clear from the definition of a violent cut because in the point of view x right here it has at most five boundary edges but in the point of a and b uh, which has like definitely smaller uh, this number of boundary edges right here that is because uh, this denser part is always replaced by the sparse interconnecting part so in the point of a it should definitely be smaller than I mean the number of boundary edges of in a and b should be smaller than x so starting with 2c minus 1 the number of boundary edges eventually hits uh, some the base case right here that's why this partition will terminate. And but the last concern we might have at this point is there might be so many number of number of partition clusters. I mean, say like exponential number of partitions, but but actually that does not happen. It, the number of the number of partition pieces is at most the number of boundary edges of initial instance. Sim uh, we can easily check it out by keeping track of this quantity, uh, which I call just de decreasing invariant. So this quantity start with like this value, right? This is clear because we start with x. And upon splitting, according upon splitting of any piece in the partition, according to violating cut, is always decreased by at least one. So starting with this quantity, and it will eventually hit zero, right? Any any single branch, any single branching. So this will stop and it will give some we can reasonably bound the number of pieces right here now that we know we know we can just contract connectivity well link set into just single point so our so all the pro, all the, our question comes down to a single question that is hey uh, what is the smallest possible size for a set with sparse boundary because you know I already I already mentioned that the we can partition G minus T into just two kind of type, right? For connectivity C well link set or a set with sparse boundary. But we know how to handle the C well link set. So all the last concern we have is for a set with sparse boundary. And this is where I use a powerful kernel logic result from cross Wallstrom. So this graph so this result was made for direct graph uh, with terminals here. And for any, so we can identify this lemma says we can always find the sort of essential vertices C, which has at most k cubic vertices, or where k is the number of terminals, uh, which is which contains a minimum vertex cut of any bipartition terminals. And this is a really strong result. And but oh, by the way, as a side note. This result was developed in the context of uh, proving some, some usefulness of vector theory for kernelization. So anyone interested in this result, of course, check out this paper, take a paper. And I think I should give some two warnings here. The first is this result was made for uh, digraph setting, right? Digraph setting. And this problem was for vertex cut, not an edge cut. It's quite different from our setting. And furthermore, uh, by their the author setup, this vertex cut may contain terminals themselves, which is also a different point in compared to our setting. So that we should somehow like change our instance. I mean, we needed to do some sort of pre-processing our graph instance to get to before we making use of this result, right? But first of all, the the first obstacle I'm um, the digraph setting, but we are working in on directive setting is not a big deal because you can just simply orient on way on direct edge by both direction. So we would have a, some directed graph, so which is not a big deal. But the main our concern, the main concern is how do we get a some valid correspondence between minimum edge cut in our graph instance and minimum vertex cut in cross wallstrom setting. This is where I show some techniques right here. So let's start with a set with sparse boundary. So that is, so like I mentioned in the observation part, we may just naively think like, okay, let's start, let's do the divide and conquer operation. That is just delete the boundary edges and mark the end point as a tentative and additional terminal, and then somehow sparsify. 
But this is not a good idea because even though we have OC terminals, we have no control over the number of incident edges to terminals. So that instead of doing so, we took one step further. That is, before doing so, let's subdivide each boundary edge. So that introduce we introduce a, a like auxiliary vertex on each boundary edge. And uh, by the way, the subdivision of the edge still does not affect TC equivalency because you know taking this set, I mean the new vertex with the outside endpoint, also a set of size two forms a rolling set, so we can contract into a single vertex so that we can go back to the original instance. So this does not affect TC equivalency. I mean this is still a uh, semi-machine network. And then we so by incorporating this new intrusive vertex. I would like to enlarge it, enlarge x into x prime. So x prime still has at most two OC boundary edges, which is actually two C minus one edges at most. And then at this point, we start to do the divide and conquer operation. So in this case, uh, not only that we have OC terminals, but also we have unique instant edge to each terminal. So we can work in much more uh, better setting. And then we jump into its line graph. So where I indicate each edge with its corresponding vertex in the line graph by the same color. So red edge goes to red vertex, and green goes to green, and blue goes to blue. It's quite obvious. So uh, a rationale behind why I'm doing so is uh, I just want to get you know correspondence between the minimum edge cut in our graph instance and minimum vertex cut in cross and wallstream instance, right? But a bit subtle thing in this case is uh, what should we view as terminals in this line graph be before we're using this uh, result, right? It's kind of a bit subtle thing. But let's think about, like, let's think about through the lens of passes, not edge cut, not, not cut. So a collection of edge disjoint passes become a collection of vertex disjoint passes in this line graph, right? It's kind of obvious thing. So, but the any edge disjoint passes, I mean, I mean, a collection of edge disjoint passes in X prime in between terminals. Uh, so I mean, those translated vertex disjoint pass collection always start and end with this vertex I and mean, color vertex, which is the corresponding vertices of the original. I mean the instant unique edges to original graph instance. So that is quite reasonable test to set these color vertices as terminals. So, and we can think of these corresponding vertices of the original, I mean the unique instant edge as terminals in cross wallstream setting. Well, and this is a really high level idea. And in actual our paper, we, I took one more step to make rigorous and to get rid of some ambiguity. So, but this is just high-level proof. And I have a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, these were the uh, extra terminals that we added, right? Mm -hmm. But in, in this original set X, couldn't there also have been some terminals laid which now don't have a unique? Uh, oh, because because this X prime comes from just G minus T. Ah, right. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. Okay. Hang on. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So, and then at, in this setting, now we would like to apply this lemma. That is, just first of all, by using this lemma, identify sort of essential vertices Z uh, of size C cubic, right? C cubic, which always contain a minimum vertex cut between by partition of terminals right here. And then we somehow, we would like to translate back this essential vertices to the original instance. So, translate it, when you translate back, those essential vertices become some a set of edges, but we can prove that the translated edges actually serve as sort of essential edges, which always contain a minimum edge cut between a terminals uh, between a partition of terminals in the original instance. Right here. And what else? We can contract all the remaining edges other than essential edges D prime, and we would have a uh, still have we can make it smaller. Uh, which is still gave us TC colon graph, and we, it has OC C cubic edges. And by the way, I don't know, just keep going, move on. So let me pull all things together here. So first of all, 
partition g minus 2, g minus t into separate pieces so that uh, where each piece becomes a serial link set or a set with sparse boundary. And for serial link set, just contract it into single vertex. And for piece with sparse boundary, having sparse boundary, you can somehow specify by making use of making making use of the colonization result so that each piece become only contains C cubic edges. And now that's finally all we need to do is just count the number of remaining edges in the current instance. That is now as we observe in the very beginning, we can we can assume that the degree of terminals is MOC. So the number of the boundary edges of terminals is m o s k times c, right? Because the number of, term number of terminal is k, and because we can assume the degree of terminal is c, simply this quantity simply become k times c. So that means we would have k c pieces at most. And for the worst case, when o d piece becomes a set with sparse boundary, which we can make smaller with like c cubic edges. So in this case, the first term becomes like kc times c cubic, which becomes k times c to the four, right? And the number of the edges between the cluster partition pieces is at most k times c squared. So these two quantity add up to k times c to the four edges. So in short, to this to cut this long story short, uh, we would get a, a c mimicking network which has at most k times c to the four edges. But let me give one more note here is, you know, because an edge gives contributes at most two vertices because of the end point, we also have like k times six of four vertices as well. So, uh, let me give you some few more commands here. So, so except for the very some, if except for the some operation which makes the degree of terminal bounded by c, we only use contraction, right? So we can say just given our k times c to the fourth specifier is a contraction based graph. And but like if you remember, we use some partition procedure based on the violated cut, right? But we have no efficient algorithm to find this uh, violating cut. So well, in fact, we took some bit other approach to find uh, some such, such a small size mimicking network. So the best upper bound is, and we can prove that the our new algorithm uh, always can always find the smallest possible size, uh, always smallest possible, uh, and which is contraction based equivalent graph. And because the, our current upper bound is k times six to the four, uh, once we we prove that the better some upper bound, then which means it directly translate into a uh, better performance for this algorithm. Well, because due to lack of time, I won't go deep into this algorithm, but the high level idea is, so when you have G, just split the partition G into several expander graphs by using expander decomposition. And based on the properties and regularity of expanders, we can efficiently specify each uh, expander, and then specify and glue them back, merge them back, by using like, based on the divide and conquer operation. And this one pass, I mean, expander decomposition and sparse by and merge back. And this one pass actually can reduce the number of edges by half. So as long as the number of edges, remaining edges in the given graph is more than the upper bound, we can just repeat this, this subroutine so that we can get uh, some the smallest possible size, smallest possible contraction based one. And as seen in the second item of our main result, we we managed to make some faster algorithm but with some worse size guarantee. So anyone interested in this second algorithm, check out the paper. And let me finish with some uh, open problem that I, that I have in my mind. That is like a similar approach in the previous words. So can you make some tighter bounds for some special graph classes? Say like planar graphs or planar graph with all terminals lying on the same face for some given uh, embedding of running graphs, or like a, for a graph with hmm, boundary trees or grid graphs, I don't know. And more interesting problem right here is the the more the, the current problem that I do right now is the I would like to, to just gap between lower bound and upper bound. And and by the way, one 
we can easily construct a graph instance which whose O mimicking network, whose O C mimicking network always require at least k times c edges. And I like to reduce the gap between the lower bound and upper bound, but well, I personally I lean more toward reducing the upper bound because that is more doable and possible. And by the way, uh, you know, taking into the cons taking into the consideration the interplay between structure graph theory and uh, like minimal edge cut probably give us a better upper bound. So what I mean by that structure knowledge, like a tree packing or like scanner tree, I don't know. So that I, what I want to say is, so experts on structure graph theory right here, so is a really a welcome for courts. And one more thing is, uh, our current proof for the existence of k times c to four super squire is quite constructive, right? We currently giving us some specific guideline how to find it, but such an existence proof doesn't need to be necessarily constructive. It, it's enough to say just it exists. So, uh, like any experts on probabilistic method or just extreme graph theory are also welcome. And finally. Uh, we took a quite a we took detour by uh, some using a kernelizing result to sparse by a set with sparse boundary. Okay. But where well, the result, I mean the, the lemma from cross Wallström was made for much more general graph classes, the general die graph, right? But as you remember, we actually worked in some line graph which has some specific structure setting, like it has no k13, I mean claw, right? Or also, the number of instant edges to terminals at one. So we have more some strict setting. So we may make this kernelization result much stronger, so that we have, so it translates into much smaller upper bound. So now you already know what I'm going to say. Right? So any experts on graph kernelization are welcome. Uh, so this is my end of talk. Thanks for listening. Yes. So, so, so in the end, in your algorithm, yeah. you consider two cases for the set X when X has small sparse boundary. Mm -hmm. And if this is not the case, then you decompose X into this extender decomposition and then contract everything. Oh, you mean yes, this one? Yeah, yeah. So oh, no, this is quite really different approach. Totally, new, totally different approach. Um, I think so previous slide maybe when you have a this one like step two are you talking about step two no I, I I thought that yeah so at the beginning I followed your explanation of this algorithm so there are basically two cases where x is either well linked or it has sparse boundary mm -hmm. uh, but you said that uh, you don't we cannot decide whether x is um, uh, c well linked and inefficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, instead, you invoke, you just use expander decomposition, isn't it? Oh, yes, but so in this case, this algorithm, so uh, you may, you may just think, think of it as just a pseudo algorithm, I mean, pseudo code for the existence of the k times c to the four size network, and the what I mean by the use, what I mean by using this extender decomposition is. We just design wholly new different approaches. You know what I'm saying? So, so, I'm so, so, so your real algorithm, your polynomial time algorithm that achieves this mimicking network mm -hmm. is that one, right? Oh, yeah, this one actually. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. So in that one, so you start with G minus, uh, V minus T, the terminal set, mm -hmm. which is the starting X, mm -hmm. and then oh, if and this, I mean, I mean, this algorithm has nothing to do with okay. this procedure. <laughs> this yeah, is just. Uh, yeah, I, I know. So I'm just trying to like. I suggest. Figure, yeah, figure. No, no. Uh, I'm just trying to recap. Uh -huh. and trying to like re recap what you're doing with the actual approach, mm -hmm. not this uh, pseudo code. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. So so in in your actual algorithm, which achieves the polynomial time algorithm. Mm -hmm. Using the expander decomposition, mm -hmm. so you you start with um, x, which excludes the terminal, and if it has sparse boundary, then you invoke 
Cartesian long sum. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's not, mm -hmm. then you use invoke expander decomposition as part by it. Is it correct? Uh, well, not, not really. Okay. You mean, you mean, so. In the next page. In the next page, yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about this. This one? Yeah. So, you mean the proof for the, so the existence or? You mean the Just the algorithm. You mean this algorithm or the yeah. previous? This algorithm? This algorithm. Oh, I mean this algorithm, it just simply just starts just G. Yeah. Just G, and the split just decompose the given G into several expanders mm -hmm. and sparse by yeah. And sparse by each expander. Yeah. And then merge them merge them back by using intercluster edges. So, all oh right. Okay, so, so here you don't distinguish case. So you don't invoke Kratzian Wangstrom. Oh well, yeah, in this case, in this yeah. algorithm, yeah, we do not invoke the cross Wangstrom one. Right. But we can prove this algorithm is supposed to find the smallest possible size uh, equivalent graph. So it's quite like the the proof for existence and the specific algorithm to find it is quite independent. Right. I see. So so you use so you the upper bound for the for the final product of that actual algorithm is given by the previous. Yeah, yeah, it's just that true. It's quite independent. So, so this k times c to the four mm -hmm. upper bound mm -hmm. it comes from the should of should of. Oh, yes, right? right. That is it. So can you explain like how this uh, upper bound from the should algorithm actually works for this? Uh, for the product obtained by using expander decomposition. Mm -hmm. So this expander decomposition, well, for if, for every single one pass, I mean, decompose it, suppress fine, and merge it back. This one pass always can reduce the number of edges by half. So like if original kind of instance is like n, then we can reduce by n over two. But we can do this thing as long as the current graph g. Mm -hmm. Say like this is initial graph instance with like m edges. I just do one pass, right? So and we would have some smaller graph g prime, this one. But as long as the number of edges in here is more than like our some uh, our proved uh, like best upper bound, we can do this. More and more as we as much as we, we want because uh, this I mean this equality I mean the current the number of edges in the current graph is more than the proved best upper bound that means they always exist on some redundant edges so redundant edges in this graph instance so we can do this the, do the same thing so you understand it. Each expander? Yeah, how, how this first by each expander? Oh, so, 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 yeah, somehow yeah. magically, the, the, this specification routine for each expander mm -hmm. detects such uh, redundant data. Yes, yes, that's true. Which is implied by the upper bounds of the shoot algorithm. Yes, that's true. Uh -huh. So, yeah, that's can true. Can you deliver some intuition on <laughs> how it does it? It sounds really magical. Mm -hmm. Or like the it's, it's like uh, just contracting just so for based on the regularity of expanded graph we can enumerate all the possible I mean mean cut of size and C mm -hmm. somehow efficiently and you know by, by contracting some edges we can just check whether this contracting, contracting edges will affect some mean cut right here mm -hmm. so it's some, somehow effectively so uh, this I reason is kind of just sort of way a bit better for first brute force I person because we just try to walk one by one, I mean contracting edges, if it violates the statistic quality, just revert the operation. If and then next do the next
contract the edges here. Yeah, it's fine, just contract it um, in this way. It's so like it's a wave. It's almost close to brute force, but I guess. So, so you're saying that basically the, the this magical routine applied mm -hmm. for each expander mm -hmm. sort like reduces it down to the optimal yes. graph. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. whatever upper bounds you have mm -hmm. for whatever different algorithm mm -hmm. that will be actually the upper bound for this algorithm. Yeah, that's true. So current yeah. upper bound I have is like right now is k times six to four. But say like third quote works, somehow we success to get the like k times to the like square edges, sparse fire, just in existence, then this algorithm can find uh, such a structured uh, sparse fire. Okay. I mean, I, uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. So in the statement of the theorem, yes. you said that you can find the connectivity C mimicking network with uh, k to the k times c to the four edges mm -hmm. in time something, mm -hmm. and I was assuming that you have a polynomial. I mean that the algorithm that runs in that time mm -hmm. to find it, mm -hmm. but then you said that there is no efficient algorithm known to detect whether some set is well linked or not, right? Mm -hmm. So, so isn't it contradictory? As I mean, the, 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 the time for the first algorithm comes from this algorithm. Oh, I see. And the, so the size is coming from the procedure that I just explained in this talk. It's, that's, why I talk that's why I say this is quite independent. Uh -huh. I see. Yeah, so you so one one part of the uh, existence <laughs> of the such a mimicking network, and then the other side, no matter which smallest exist smallest mimicking network, you can find it uh -huh. by certain algorithm. Yes. Uh -huh. so, so, you, so using this expander decomposition, you can always find the optimum graph that mimics the mean cuts. Yes. And in <laughs> linear time, in linear time. Oh. Yes, of course. So here. Something that's but if we were some, some <laughs> fixed constant C right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, well, one of our trier during IRB, IRB Georgia Tech is try to make this iron like depend on just pulling everything in C. But one of the colleagues told me that he is quite pessimistic because mm -hmm. the finding of purchase card is kind of empty hard. Yeah. So, yeah. well, it's not so um, do mm -hmm. not doable. So. So yeah, so the thing <laughs> I want to talk about in this talk is just, you know, through co-working with your <laughs> structural knowledge on graph theory, you may give us a better upper bound. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Or, yes, uh, what about rational rate? Huh? What about the rational uh, rate? Ah, you mean Q? So original Q to Q? No, no, no. I with mean, the, I mean for, for rational C. C. Mm -hmm. uh, rational C? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not that clear how we find it. Uh, but I think there wouldn't be some big difference because just by uh, because our edge ways are basically working natural number. So yeah, I don't think it's too big. Is there any question? Um, uh -huh. So so now back to your proof, constructive proof of the upper bound. Oh yeah. The Q2 algorithm. <laughs> So you, there are two cases. One yes. is when x is c well linked, uh -huh. and there is when there is a sparse boundary. Yes. So what? So and especially you um, you invoke this case b when it's not well linked, right? Um, in second line. Yeah. Oh second yeah. Line. Not well linked. Yeah. And then so boundary is b. Right? Yeah. Well, when, when it's not well linked and when it's sparse boundary, but suppose the Boundary size is part uh, so boundary size is bounded, mm -hmm. but still you can by by cutting it into two parts you can still decrease the boundary size. So why? What do oh, you that's what why that's why I take maximum right here. So once the boundary number hit the two minus one, I'll yeah. stop it. So so what happens if you like continue? Uh, continue um, doing yeah, that. Continue splitting thing? them until you come up with just two boundary or three boundary. So what's wrong? Oh, oh yeah, case? that's one point that I considered in a long time ago. That in this case, we might have no control over the number of pieces. Yes. So 
the, well, the very, very beginning approach of here is we just go to like zero or one boundary edges. In this case, we would have a, like, like quite explained number of pieces. We can prove by induction thing. So we, at the time, we have like k time, like some three to the c edges before I do this time. So that's why. Like, oh. Oh, and I think I should finish with some giving you some anecdotes. That is, you know, before I came to I'm joining the IDS, the best upper bound I have is k times two to the six, which is way bigger than k times two to the four. But thanks to fruitful discussion with Dong Yu, I managed to improve for k times two to the four. So I just publicly appreciate his help. Let's cut the video. But not anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank no, you. I'm kidding. <laughs> Any any other questions? Uh, yeah, if not, let's thank the speaker again.